The topic of, topic of religious extremism, which we'll be looking at this morning, in Arabic is expressed as al ghulu fiddin. Al ghulu fiddin. In that, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in a hadith authenticated, found in the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Sunan of An-Nasai and Ibn Majah, Ibn Abbas quotes the Prophet sallallahu alaihi as saying, "Iyakum wal ghulu fiddin." Beware of extremism in religion. فَإِنَّمَا هَلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ بِالْغُلُوِّ فِي الدِّينِ For those before you were only destroyed by going to extremes in religion. So this was the warning of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُوِّ فِي الدِّينِ وَالْغُلُوَّ فِي الدِّينِ Beware of extremism in religion. He also said, Halaka al mutanatti'un The extremists will be destroyed. This is authentically uh, recorded in Sahih Muslim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran called to the people of the book in Surah An-Nisa as well as in Surah Al-Ma'idah Ya Ahl Al-Kitab La Taghlu Fi Deenikum O people of the scripture do not go to extremes in your religion addressing the Jews and the Christians primarily but people of the scripture in the wider sense includes Muslims also. We are the true people of the scripture. And that represents the warning both from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with regards to extremes in religion. After that warning, we then have to figure out what is extreme, what constitutes extremism, because this term extremism is used in a number of different contexts. So that is what we're going to be looking at uh, in this session, this morning. Uh, what constitutes extremism? And why... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when speaking about Muslims, or addressing Muslims, as a nation, the Ummah, he focused on being in the middle. He said, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 143, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ In that way, I made you a middle nation. And by being a middle nation, it meant, as the scholars explained, a balanced nation. You're right in the middle. You're not on either sides. You know, too much this way, too much that way. You're right, balanced, a justly balanced nation as witnesses against humankind as witnesses against humankind and the prophet sallallahu had explained in a hadith authentic hadith also that people on the day of judgment will be asked about uh, following allah's commands and they will claim that the commands didn't come to them and prophet muhammad sallallahu will be brought forth and he will call his nation to bear witness that the message was conveyed. So we are 
as a Muslim nation, we have the responsibility of carrying that message, and at the same time, we would be witnesses against the other nations that claim, or that will claim on the Day of Judgment, they didn't know anything about it, we will be witnesses that inshallah, we did convey the message, we did represent, stand behind, and promote the message of Islam in the world. So, Allah chose us, chose this nation, the best among the nations, in order that they would exemplify the middle path, Siratul Mustaqim. That same path that we ask for 17 times each day is none other than Siratul Mustaqim. The Siratul Mustaqim is the middle path, the path of the middle nation, the balanced nation. So, to understand how extremism challenges that, that basic character or characteristic of the Muslim nation, we need to understand the principles with regards to Allah's instructions and the nation itself. The most basic principle that we hear repeated throughout the Quran, <clears throat> and we hear it also in many places in the Sunnah, is ease. Allah did not place any difficulty in this religion. With every difficulty comes ease. The ease is the point which is stressed throughout the Quran. We find Prophet Muhammad had said, Inna dina yusrun walan yushad dina ahadun illa ghalaba. Certainly the religion is easy. Whoever becomes overly strict with the religion will be overcome by it. This is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari. The religion is easy. Whoever goes to extremes in making it difficult, then it will overcome that individual in the end. So, again, we need to know the lines of what constitutes easy and the ease and where the difficulty of extremism, produced by extremism, comes into play. <clears throat> and of course, if it is left up to us, then everybody has his version, his idea as to what constitutes strictness, over strictness. So we will never be able to identify the golden mean, the middle path if it is left up to us and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his mercy he sent Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to show us that golden mean the middle path so he becomes the criterion we judge the middle path by what he did he is the best example that's what Allah calls him in the Quran لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ there is in the Messenger of Allah for you the best of examples. The best example of the middle path is found in the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, where we go beyond the bounds that were shown by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether to too much or too little, that's where we go to extremes. Extremism means 
going beyond the bounds that were set by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's what it, that is the simplest definition because he was the example he knew what Allah meant when he gave his commands he in his life lived that middle path he gave us the example of how to live the middle path so whenever we step beyond it we have gone to extremes this is where we find the ghulu and he was very you know uh, precise very particular about preventing stopping any form of extremism in the religion so for example when he came among his companions on one occasion and they stood up for him those who had gone were trading north into Syria etc where when the king comes people all rise for the king they came back with this idea that we should be doing this for Rasulullah sallallahu you know if they're rising for the kings there we should be rising all the time for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they stood up for him and he stopped them he told them sit down don't stand for me this standing is for Allah qiyam this is our first posture in prayer it's qiyam we stand up for Allah and that's why any other standing if we stand up when the Malaysian flag flutters and the anthem is sung we have to say where is that from the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam Or when the teacher comes in, or when a big person comes in, portent, whatever, or in the courts, all rise. You know, all of this standing is questionable. It is a form of extremism. But the society considers it as normal now. To not stand, that is the extreme. <laughs> right? What kind of extremist are you? You're refusing to stand. You know, so you see how the... the uh, uh, the, the determination of what is extreme can shift from time to time, from country to country, all of this. So we have to have some basic principles which guides us in the end. And those basic principles come from the Sunnah. So you can imagine that if the Prophet ﷺ prohibited standing for him the common custom, Malay custom, of making rukur by the younger people when the elder come to the hand. We well, say it's custom. It's because we don't mean rukur. But it is rukur. I look at it, it is people are making rukur. You know? And if we go if we use the argument of custom. Then I visited Nigeria a few years back, and in Nigeria when the sheikh comes in, the people rush and make sujood at his feet. <laughs> and it's their custom. And, they, and I, they, when I said it, they said, no, it's not sujood. It's, it's just respect. And in India also, when the teacher comes in the classroom, the students come prostrating at her feet. Save the questions to the end. The point is that if Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu prohibited the standing, then bowing will be obviously far more prohibited. Bowing will obviously be far more prohibited. And prostrating even more so. So the issue is not merely that of intention. If I say my intention in drinking this glass of vodka is just to enjoy the taste. I, I'm not intending to get drunk or, you know. I don't, we don't use our intention. We said our intention is for this or for that. You know, uh, this is not the basis of the deen. Yes, intentions and deeds will be judged according to their intentions. But this is what good deeds. 
Good deeds are judged by their intentions. That's what is meant by the Prophet's statement, Innam al A'mal bin Niyat. That is fundamentally it. So, when we look then at the issue of what constitutes the middle path, we see that people deviate from the middle path in two general ways. There are two main ways by which they deviate. One, in the area of beliefs. They enter into extreme beliefs. They've gone beyond in their beliefs this, the bounds which have been set by Allah and His Messenger. And we see also people deviating and going to extremes in their acts. These are two categories which are interrelated because acts are preceded by beliefs. Isn't it? But where the belief is the greater driving force, which we're cause, calling that extremism in belief. Where the acts are greater driving force, we call it extremism in acts. The most dangerous form of extremism, obviously, is extremism in belief. That is the most dangerous because that is what produces in the end sectarianism where people splinter off and end up into major deviations leaving Islam. So the danger of, the, of extremism and belief is what should concern us as a priority but still extremism in acts remains. If we look at uh, extremism in acts, we find a, a, a good example from the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, which was narrated by Anas ibn Malik, that when three of the Sahaba came to the wives of the Prophet Sallam and they asked them about the way that the Prophet Sallam used to worship. And after they described to him, to them, the wives of the Prophet described to those three Sahaba how he used to worship, they said, you know, mashallah, you know, Allah has forgiven the Prophet Sallallahu sins of the past and the future. So, that is enough, what he does. However, we, who don't have that promise of Allah, that our past sins and our future sins are forgiven, we need to do more. So, one of them said, he would pray all night, every night for the rest of his life. Another one said he would fast without breaking his fast. And the third one said that he would not marry. He wouldn't marry. He would stay away from women altogether. When the Prophet ﷺ came back and he heard from his wives what these people had said, he called them. And he called the people. And he said to them, Wallahi inni la lillah. By Allah, I fear Allah more than all of you. And I am more conscious of Him than any of you. Lakinni asumu wa uftir. Wa usalli wa arqud. Wa atazawwaju nisa. Faman raghiba an sunnati. Falaysa minni. Yet, I fast and I break it. I pray and I sleep. And I marry women. So whoever dislikes my sunnah, my way, is not among my followers. For us to like another way, other than the way of Rasulullah wasallam, this takes us out of the realm of his followers. True followers. There was also another narration in the time uh, one of the companions, uh, Ibn Abbas, narrated that during the time of the Prophet Sallam, he was giving a lecture and he noticed at the back of the lecture one individual who was standing. Everybody else was sitting and he was standing there. And he was standing in the sun. So the Prophet Sallam asked the companions, what, what's happening to him? 
They said his name is Abu Israel, right? And he had vowed, he'd made a vow to Allah that he would stand in the sun, right? And he would not sit, nor would he seek any shade, nor would he speak, and he would fast. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard that, he instructed them, go tell him to speak, shade himself, sit down, but continue his fast. Okay. So these acts were not specifically religious acts, but these acts constituted harm to himself. And the Prophet ﷺ, as a result of that, labeled it a form of extremism. So he prohibited it. Another occasion, he was going for Hajj, and he saw a man uh, being carried by his two sons, walking for Hajj. And they were sort of using the shoulders of his two sons to help him. And the Prophet ﷺ asked about it, and he vowed, he told him that he had vowed to Allah that he was going to walk to Hajj. But he was an old man. The Prophet ﷺ told him, you know, break your vow, get a ride, you know, and make up for it. So it is not something pleasing to Allah, to, for a person to torture himself, physically, vowing things which are harmful, painful to oneself. This is not from Islam, but represents a form of extremism. In the case of extremism in belief, we find an occasion towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the last battles, after which the Prophet ﷺ was distributing the uh, spoils of war, and after he distributed it amongst the companions, one among them stood up and said, Be fair. Messenger of Allah, be fair. The Prophet ﷺ actually was upset with what he said. Because if he wasn't fair, where is their fairness? You know, because what he's doing is on, on, on the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, when the individual turned and left, one of the companions actually asked, should I go and kill him, O Messenger of Allah? Khalid bin Walid, you know? You know, for the man to have said this, you know? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. He said, indeed, there will be from his descendants those who will recite the Qur'an, but it will not go beyond their throats. And they will slaughter Muslims while leaving the pagans free. So in that hadith, scholars have deduced two characteristics of extremism in belief. One, the misinterpretation of the Quran. And two, declaring Muslims to be disbelievers. And these characteristics we can see manifest from the first of the sects that broke away from mainstream Islam, the Khawarij. We see it in the Shia. And we see it in all of the subsequent groups right down till today. These same characteristics. Where verses of the Quran are misinterpreted and they end up declaring the main body of Muslims to be disbelievers. So when we look today, for example, at the biggest uh, sect that has broken away from mainstream Islam are the Shia. They're the biggest sect. In the past, it was the Khawarij, but the Khawarij basically are not around today except in Oman. Uh, the governing, the ruling community of Oman are from the Khawarij. They're the only remaining uh, presence of the Khawarij in our time. And they represent a moderate wing, a liberal wing 
of the Khawarij. Right? So they don't hold some of the extreme beliefs of the earlier body that broke off and slaughtered Muslims, slaughtered the Sahaba, you know, while claiming that they were upholding the Quran. You know. In the case of the Shia, this is one major group, and its sister group, the Sufiya, Tasawwuf, and Shia are two sides of the same coin. They share the same beliefs. Of course, it comes in a different package, but when you look at it in its essence, when you take off the outer external differences, you find the commonality internally. And even the Shia, they claim that they were the inventors of Sufism. They claim that. Right? Of course, much of the, the Ummah who may be involved in Sufism, they reject that claim. But the Shia claim it. And the Shia actually, they appeared before the Sufis. Right? So if we look into how, in terms of belief, the Shia went to extremes. We know that their main focus is on the 12 Imams. And the way in which they perceive the 12 Imams is that they have some of the major attributes of Allah. They believe that the Imams first and foremost are Infallible. Infallible. Infallible from the time they were born till the time they died. Right? We know about the Pope. The Catholics believe that when the Pope is invested in the office or the papacy, he becomes infallible. That's their belief also. Because he is the spokesman of God on the earth. So they believe he's infallible. But their belief is less than the Shia. Because the Shia are saying there's no point from the time of birth till the time of death, the Imams are infallible. They're incapable of making a mistake or doing an error. Incapable. We say, that is Allah. Everybody else, as Prophet Muhammad said, Kullu bani Adam khatta. All of Adam's descendants make mistakes. Khatta means makes plenty of mistakes. So, how can somebody then come and say, he or she is infallible? Furthermore, the Shia believe that the Imams are omniscient. They have knowledge of all things. What is in the Lawh al Mahfuz? They know. That's what they believe. Absolute knowledge. So we say, that is Allah. They also believe that the Imams are omnipotent, that they have power over the atoms of the universe. And they like to quote the case of Ali ibn Abi Talib, which they claim. Uh, one occasion, uh, he was involved in some battle, and uh, the battle was prolonged, and the time for Asr came, and the sun set without them being able to pray. So Ali ibn Abi Talib commanded the sun to rise again so he could pray his asr and then allowed it to set. This is among their beliefs. Imam Khomeini, he says it very clearly in his book Al-Hukum al islamiyah 
you know, the Islamic state, government, that the Imams have a special station above that of the Prophets with a creational caliphate. They call it Al Khilafa at Taqwiniya. And when you go and read about what do they mean by Khilafa Taqwiniya? You know, it means that they control the atoms of the universe. This is the Imams. So, if we go into Sufism, right, we find infallibility in another version. When you become the murid of your sheikh, you become a follower of a particular sheikh, then you are supposed to believe in him absolutely. That he can do no wrong. So they tell you, if you even see him drinking a bottle of alcohol, know that it may appear that way to you, but that's not what it is really. <laughs> you see him committing adultery, know that it is not what you see, because what you see may not be what really is, you know, like Khidr and, and, and Musa. And, yeah. Because your Shaykh can do no wrong. He has become one with Allah. He is in fact Allah on the earth. They don't say it that way. But when you say he's become one with Allah, you know, he's, he's, he's arrived, they call it Wusul. He has arrived, you know, and uh, he becomes, you know, what they call, um, they call it what, uh, Etihad or, or what is it? Um, uh, they have some, I've forgotten, my, it slips my mind right at the moment, the terminology which indicates that he, his self, his, his being becomes one. Uh, no, it's different. But um, the, the point is, he becomes one with Allah. Right? So, at that state, he sees what Allah sees. Means, he knows the past, the present, and the future. He hears what Allah hears. Of course, there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ had said, that the slave does not come close to Allah except by doing what is compulsory for him or her. And if they continue to worship Allah through voluntary worship, they come closer and closer to Allah until they, uh, they become, their, their sight right, becomes uh, the sight of Allah. Allah becomes their sight. That's how it's expressed in the hadith. But they're seeing as Allah sees. And they're hearing, touching, walking, related back to Allah. But the scholars of mainstream Islam all understood that it meant that they would only see what was pleasing to Allah. Right? They would avoid looking at that which was displeasing to Allah. Not that Allah literally becomes their sight. That they see what Allah sees. No. How can? We are human beings, finite. We cannot see what the infinite sees. Right? So they give their imams these attributes you know, of Allah in terms of knowledge. In terms of power, you know, they have this belief that whenever Allah sends down blessings, the leading Sufi saint, they call the Qutb or the pole, it comes to him. Then he distributes it over the earth to the people of the earth. So he has control over Allah's blessings to give to who he chooses. So, we see in the end 
when we look back at the Shia and we say, okay, after they've had this belief in the Imams in this way, then what is the consequence of that? The consequence is that they then, believing that the Imams are infallible, know everything, capable to do anything, they pray to them. So the Imams become intermediaries between themselves and Allah. They pray to the Imams. They have special prayer books which you call on Hassan, you call on Hussein, you call on you know, the various Imams, Ali, etc. Call on Fatima. They didn't exclude Fatima. She's included. You know. They talk about the 14 infallibles. The main 12 and then you have an extra two, Fatima and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, They call on them in prayer. And similarly, when you look in the Sufiya, they call on, the imam, on their saints. The people who they have elevated to the status of having this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they call on them in prayer. So when trials befall them, they call on the people like Abdul Qadir is the pop, most popular saint to call on, you know, in trial times. Ya Abdul Qadir, aghifni. Oh Abdul Qadir, save me. They will say that openly, no problem. They will go to the tombs, make tawaf around the tombs, prostrate at the tombs, and that's what the Shia do when they go to their mashhad. You know, where you know, Ali ibn Abi Talib is buried and so on. So they go there, make tawaf, prostrate, everything. Especially Karbala, you know, where Hussein was killed, radiallahu anhu, where they believe because he was killed there and his blood touched the earth of Karbala, Karbala becomes the most holy spot on the earth, more holy than Mecca. So much so, that they make clay tablets out of the earth of, of, from Karbala, they call turbat, and they take it with them. Whenever they have to prostrate, they put it down, they prostrate on it. Yes. You will see it if you pass any their mosque, you go inside, you see all these little tablets, stone tablets on the, on the, the mats, the prayer mats. It's all over. So, they, the intermediacy that you find in Shiaism you find it also in Sufiya. So this is the shared uh, extreme beliefs. And this is what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you know, stressed. Do not be excessive in your praise of me. As people before were excessive in the praise of Isa, Ibn Maryam. I'm only a slave of Allah and his messenger. Stressing this point. Don't be excessive. Because in their excessive praise, the Christians, in their excessive praise of Isa alayhi salam, they elevated him to be the son of God and to be God. So they worshipped him. So this is the same thing that has happened with the other groups. They followed that same extremism of the Christians. So what we have... Uh, in terms of extremism and belief, you know, today those are the main uh, areas that we see. We do have, along with that, uh, the groups who, while not going to extremes in how they hold leaders, they've gone to extremes in how they judge the followers under the banner of Hakimiyah, right? Hakimiyah, which as a principle, Tawheed al Hakimiyah, as a principle, is a valid principle in Islam. Tawheed al Hakimiyah means that rule, government, should be in accordance with the rule of Allah. That's what it basically means. And it is an extension of Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah or unity of lordship, of, uh, of worship. That part of our worship of Allah is applying His laws not only in our personal selves but in our societies. That stands. But people who have gone to extremes in our time have taken this aspect and focused on this aspect of the rule of Allah, which now 
overrides everything else. So from that, they concluded that if you don't rule according to the rule of Allah, you are a disbeliever. Now, there are verses in the Quran which say that. Whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed are disbelievers. It's there in the Quran. But it's also there that Allah describes them as fasiqoon, as dhalimun, you know, as being oppressive and sinful, of, be, of being corrupt. So, we don't just have one ruling that everybody who does not rule by the rule of Allah is automatically a disbeliever. But we have different grades. There are shades of gray. It's not just black and white. But these people have taken it in a black and white approach. If you don't rule by Allah's law, then you are a disbeliever. And whoever works for you is also a disbeliever. Whoever is paid by you is a disbeliever. So then, being a disbeliever, your blood now becomes halal. And they unleash violence against the Muslim population. Various groups which popped up in Egypt and elsewhere have promoted and propagated that approach. So their extremism uh, is expressed in how they judge Muslims. It's an extension from that first individual that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about who would slaughter Muslims, his descendants would slaughter Muslims while letting aside the disbelievers. They will not focus on disbelievers, they'll focus on Muslims and end up kill, killing Muslims. Declaring them to be non-Muslims. And this was the Khawarij. So we have people of our time also promoting that uh, methodology which represents an element of extremism in belief. In terms of extremism in practice and acts, what we see today is the various customs and traditions which we find in different parts of the Muslim world, which are in fact innovations in the religion itself. Whether it is uh, forced marriage, that is an extreme in the religion. Forcing our daughters to marry people of our choice, this is extremism. When the Prophet ﷺ had said that the daughter should have her choice. Right? You can suggest, you can encourage, but the choice should be in her hand. So when you remove the choice from her hand, you have gone to an extreme. That is extremism right there. Also, where uh, in the society we have you know, other practices which are based on uh, other customs like uh, female genital mutilation, for example. Uh, this is an area that the Muslims are attacked on. That they're involved in this practice. Again, this is not in accordance with the teachings of Islam, teachings of the Prophet Wasallam. And uh, it becomes a form of extremism. In all of the other areas where women are denied, for example, masjids, to go to the masjid. Here, for example, in, in Malaysia, uh, generally speaking, Juma is not attended by women. You know? They're discouraged. In India, they don't even have a place in the masjid for women. There's no women's section at all. A woman tries to get in the masjid, the men will stand and bar her from entering the masjid. That's how they've made the masjids. They don't believe that women have a place here. This is extremism in practice. It's based on ignorance. It's coming out of ignorance. But much of what we have to struggle against today in these practices, as well as a variety of other you know, uh, acts which are uh, holding Muslims back, whether it enters, uh, enters into areas of the supernatural, the way, you know, for example, this Bomo thing that you guys have here in, in Indonesia, you know, how you're caught up into it and 
people going to this one and that one, they're calling on the jinn and this, or this is extremism. You know? Prophet Muhammad he wasn't doing that. The Sahaba, when people came, they were not calling on the jinn. They didn't have jinn working for them and you know, people say, hey, he's got a good jinn working for him. And this is nonsense. This is all nonsense. It's not from the way of the Prophet and his companions. But it's become widespread. People become very superstitious. Anything happens, it's magic. Somebody did some magic on us. And, you know. So it's widespread. People abusing it. You know, uh, Taking people's money, claiming to cure this one and that one. And maybe the issues are psychological. It's not even jinn at all. So we have, we have it coming from all kinds of directions in our societies today. And um, even we could say that the way in which Islam is taught today, where understanding of Islam is missing. People are just told to do what we do because you're a Muslim. That's why you pray five times a day, that's why you fast, and so on, so so. Just do it. You know, and so people grow up with the under the pressure of society, etc. They grow up practicing, but they don't really know why they practice. So when circumstances arise, they travel overseas, they go to universities, now all their classmates are non Muslims and they start to question them, Why do you do this? Why do you do that? I'm not really sure. You know? And more questions arise, then they start to doubt. Why am I doing it, really, anyway? You know? It's just making life more difficult for me. And the next thing you know, they're leaving it aside, they're dropping it in. You're, finally, your daughter or your son calls you back from so-and-so says, listen, I don't believe in Islam anymore. Why? Because they didn't understand it in the first place. If they ask a question, you say, shh, shaitan. They <laughs> say, shaitan has got you. You know, don't ask that question. Why? Because you didn't have an answer. Right? <laughs> you never asked the question because you were afraid of your parents. And they were, you know, something handed down. But this is not the way. You know, Allah gave us intelligence. He gave us reason to understand. Of course, that reason does have its limits. But as much as we can understand, we should understand. Because if we've understood why we're doing it, that gives us motivation to want to do it more. When we don't understand, it's just like a burden that we have to do. So uh, much of our problems, internal problems in the Muslim world today, this is a result of extremism in the acts that we follow. What we call bid'ah, you know, in terms of our practice, this is uh, holding the ummah back. And the real problem behind it all is ignorance. Not knowing the religion. Not understanding the teachings so we can find that sirat al-mustaqim. That middle path. Now, looking from the other side, the side of the secularists because the Muslim world is under attack today you know a global attack a global attack led by secular Western civilization we have internal representatives for that same secularism who are attacking us from within. But we have a major attack coming from the outside. Some people say, well, no, 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 it's not really attack. You know, this is a distorted way of looking at it. You know, really, it's the Western civilization. They just want to, you know, help us, help us to develop. And, you know, they don't really, you know, this is an extreme way to look at this as them and us. But the thing is that Western civilization has divorced itself from revelation. Se secularism means exactly that. That human life, political, social, etc., 
uh, where it is ruled by law should not be governed by religion. Because fundamentally, those who promote secularism, religion is made up anyway. So if you made up, you have a made up religion and he has a made up religion, you know, why should yours be the rule and not his, you know? So uh, you can keep this made up religion as your own personal thing. But for society as a whole, it must, religion must not come into play because it will lead to conflict. So they say, remove religion, we just deal with human needs, humanism. We focus on our human needs. So what, what do we do? We decide on right and wrong. How do we do it? Because before we used to have to use religion, right? What was right and wrong was what was in the Bible. Western civilization was Christian. So the Bible, Old Testament, identified what are evils, what are okays, etc. So now when we take away the Bible, how do we determine what's good and what's wrong? Evil. Democracy. Let's, uh, we, we have a principle here. Democracy, where the majority agree on something, that's what's good. If the majority don't agree, they feel otherwise, then that's what's bad. That's our principle. What that does, of course, is it removes any solid basis for morality in the society. Because if the majority feel something is good today, it's good. If they think it's bad tomorrow, it becomes bad. What was bad today can become good. So, where is your basis? And that's exactly what has happened in the society. That the, the values that were held have been turned upside down. Before uh, the 70s, if you asked anybody in the 60s, for example, about homosexuals, they would say, oh, bad people, corrupt, sick. An abomination unto the Lord, as in the Old Testament. And the psychiatrist considered them to be ill. They had all these treatments in their psych psychiatric man manuals, you know, electric treatment, drug treatments, all kinds of treatments for them. <laughs> but by the middle 70s, things turned around. All of a sudden, it, you ask the average American, what's the case of homosexuals? They say, alternative lifestyles. <laughs> you know, it's just an, an, another way of living, you know. Different strokes for different folks. You know? <laughs> this, this is how it's put, you know. It's, who am I to say? I, I personally not, but you know, if they wanted to be that way, it's, it's their thing. It's okay. And the psychiatric profession removed the illness of homosexuality from the book, and they replaced it with what? Homophobia. <laughs> Those people who consider, who still have the nerve to consider homosexuals to be sick and, you know, despicable, etc. These people are now sick. And they need to go to the psychiatrist and get, you know, reprogrammed, corrected. Right? And uh, I don't know if you've been following the news, but recently I was banned from Germany for life. Right? I gave a lecture in, in Germany, in Frankfurt, Germany. This is just three, three months ago, two months ago. And alhamdulillah, big public lecture after it, 17 Germans accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah. After that, on my way to the hotel, the German SWAT team came and surrounded the car and took me down to the police station and read me a manifesto from the, the mayor of Frankfurt saying, you are banned from Germany for life. Why? Because you advocate the execution of homosexuals. I said, what? <laughs> How is that? You know, yeah, Islamic law says that, you know, if you're caught in the act in an Islamic state, you will be executed. If you've been seen by four witnesses, etc., execution, that's the law. They say, but, but the homosexuals are a respected part of our society whose rights should be protected against anyone who would speak ill of them. You know, and uh, we fear that you, even though, yes, you're saying that you don't, call for their execution, that this is Islamic law, but we fear that at some time you may say this to the young people and tell them to go out and kill homosexuals. So therefore, we will ban you for life. You know. So, uh, 
Allahu Akbar. <laughs> you know, this is this is their position, and of course, uh, you know, this is just an ongoing uh, saga with the homosexuals. So, if you go on YouTube and you click Islam and homosexuality, there's only one lecture, mine. <laughs> <laughs> I gave one lecture, a part of a series of lectures, which basically was in defense of Islamic law and its rulings concerning adultery, you know, theft, etc. You know, it, it talked about many other things, but among them was homosexuality and its punishment in Islam. It was a, a lecture given in defense of Islamic law. It looked at all of the arguments of the homosexuals. They like to say, you know, it's nature, it's in nature, it's not unnatural like you all are saying. Because we can find a fish off the coast of Japan who when the male mates with the female, he now starts to act like a female. So the other males come and try to you know, mate with him and that way they don't get to his female. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a fish like that off, off the coast of Japan. And there's a, also a butterfly in South America that does the same thing. So he said it's not unnatural. So I said there, that, okay, we also have the black widow spider. You know, the black widow spider, when she finishes mating with her husband or mate, she kills him and eats him. So is that okay now? Uh, we say it's natural for wives if they, you know, have that inclination to kill their husbands and eat them. <laughs> That's it. So I, I went through their genetic arguments and all the different arguments, and I showed that they were false. So I have attacked <laughs> the homosexuals according to their you know judgment because it is not for them it's not enough to say well okay we accept you you have the right to make your choice no they're saying don't even say anything against us not only toleration we want to be respected and liked and they have now introduced into the educational systems of the West in the states uh, kids in grade one on the East Coast have a book which is called My Two Dads. Yeah. yeah, grade one, My Two Dads. In it, Johnny has two dads, you know, Tommy has a dad and a mom. But Johnny's two dads, they're really great guys, you know, they take him to the beach, they take him to the playground, they take him here, they take him there, you know to get the children used to the idea of two dads. In England, the book they have is called The Prince. Grade one, grade two students. The kingdom of so-and-so, they had a prince who they were trying to get a wife for. The parents were bringing this young, beautiful princess and this one, but no, 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 he didn't like this one. Finally, he met another prince. And they liked each other, and they were close, and they were the, you know, so, you know, very subtly feeding these ideas into the society. So they are coming at the, you know, that civilization. They're coming at them in full force, in full force. And of course, it's coming at us too, because from there it comes to us. It's just a matter of time. So that, you know, extremist uh, approach through secularism, is the major threat to Muslims today. Besides the problems that we have of our own ignorance, in terms of our practice of Islam, etc., we have this other huge challenge in front of us, the secularists. And for the secularist, you know, anyone who seeks to practice Islam properly, is an extremist. That is extremism. They only want what we may call liberal Islam or nominal Islam. It's okay if you, you know, drink, you shake the hands of women, you know, you don't pray, Ramadan, you don't fast, maybe you fast a day or two, whatever, like this. That's what they want. But for you to insist, no, five times daily prayer, that's what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to dress this way. You're supposed to you know, eat this way. You're supposed to act this way, and so on, so on. That is extreme. That is extreme. So that is the, that is the struggle, and that is the, 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 the test, and 
and challenge that the Muslim world is facing today. And it becomes greater and greater as Muslims become more and more conscious. Because 25 years ago, you didn't hear this stuff. You know, they weren't banning veils in France and Belgium and all that. Why are they banning now? Why not 25 years ago? Well, because 25 years ago, nobody was wearing veils. You know, Muslim women, in many parts of the Muslim world, didn't no hijab. There was no hijab. Right? So this change that has happened with the ummah, where there's an awakening, where people are now becoming conscious and, and, and dressing and speaking and acting as Muslims, rec recognizing and identifying their identity and taking it on, this is now a threat. So when you listen to the, the, the presidents of Germany and France and UK, what they're saying to the Muslims there is that you are supposed to be a German first. You should look like a German. You should talk like a German. You should walk like a German and think like a German. But you can also still be Muslim. I'm not saying you can't be Muslim, but these other things must take precedence. Same thing in France. They're all saying the same, same thing. They want this, you know, uh, you could say, uh, they call it um, assimilation, integration. But really what it means is to become one of them. And Allah spoke about it in the Quran 1,400 years ago. وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتُهُمْ the Jews and the Christians will not be pleased with you until you follow their way. Way doesn't necessarily mean you convert to Christianity or Judaism, but follow their way. What is the way? Secularism. Because are Westerners really Christians? They're a minority. I mean, people would say, yeah, I'm Christian, but what does it mean? They wear maybe wear a big cross, you know, it's just style. You know? But what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. They're leaving the churches you know, in droves. Clo churches are being closed, shut down all over the, the West. In the Britain, it's so many, and Muslims are buying up the churches and turning them into masjids, that finally the church said, ah, we have to stop this. You know, they made a law amongst themselves that they will not sell any churches to Muslims. They will sell it to become a bar or a bowling alley or anything, but not to Muslims. But that's what's happening. So the West is not really a Christian thing. Some people think of it as like, you know, a crusading. Yeah, there are, you know, fundamentalists out there and they're, you know, doing their thing and converting Muslims in different parts of the world too. That's happening. But that's not the major thing. The major thing is secular Western civilization, which looks at Islam as an extreme. Because their basic principle is that religion should not interfere in the governance of people. Whereas Islam, Sharia says, religion is supposed to interfere in every aspect of the governance of people. So here are two poles, like the north and the south, the east and the west, two poles apart. Now Islam doesn't say, we now must force everybody to follow our way. It doesn't say that. You want to believe that, okay? We can deal with you on trade, etc. It's not the problem. But, the West is driven to impose this on us because they believe, according to evolutionary theory, that they are the most evolved of human beings on the earth today. Western civilization is at the pinnacle of the pyramid of evolution. So they feel it their duty to help those down the bottom by imposing their secular systems on them, helping them. So, in the name of security, world, uh, peace, uh, protecting civilization, they wage a war of jihad against the Muslim world. They don't call it jihad. If we fight back, it's jihad. But when they're doing, if you think about it, they're doing jihad for their belief system, to promote it. They're in Afghanistan, <laughs> you know, they're in Iraq, they're in, our, in the Muslim lands, waging a war of jihad to promote their secular way 
on the Muslim world. That is the bottom line. You know, if, if jihad means to struggle against evil and to promote good, that is the essential meaning of jihad. So you can make jihad with yourself, within yourself, against the evil tendencies. Jihad in your family, jihad in your society, jihad outside of your society. Promoting the good and prohibiting the evil. Isn't that what they claim? When they went into Iraq, weapons of mass destruction, right? to prevent the evil of Saddam with all these weapons of mass destruction which he didn't have. Right? They were going in there to stop and protect the world against him. So they were waging jihad. So this is the uh, struggle that we have faced today on a world scale that Western civilization have identified those who seek to practice Islam as it is in the Quran and the Sunnah to live their lives according to that as being extremists. So we are religious extremists. And we're labeled fundamentalists who, that's the title given to the extremists, religious extremists amongst themselves. Christian sects that believe that the Bible is the word of God from Genesis to Revelation and so on and so forth, infallible, etc. They label their people that, and then they put the same label on us. So, extremist, fundamentalist, terrorist, because that's what it becomes now. And, you know, as people have pointed out, this guy in Norway, who is a Christian fundamentalist, who blew up all these people, waging war against Muslims, he, they don't call him, you know, a Christian terrorist. You will not see anywhere in those news, they say a Christian fundamentalist who committed this act of terrorism, but you will never see in the news Christian terrorist. But you let one Muslim do anything. And this is Muslim terrorism. Right? Always Muslim terrorism. Not a Muslim who committed a terroristic act, but Muslim terrorist. These two are put together. And this is deliberate uh, media uh, blackening, distortion of what Islam is and what it represents. So, to bring us back to where we began, that religious extremism is something which both the Quran and the Sunnah warned against. We, in practicing our Islam, have to be careful not to fall into any of the extremes. Whether we try to overdo it in acts which go beyond what the Prophet ﷺ has shown us, or we become so lax we don't do what we should have been doing, either side are the extremes that take us away from being ummatun wasa, wasatun. This is middle nation which Allah describes us as having made us to be that middle nation that would be the example for human society of the way which Allah wants us to be. And this is what we have to offer the world today. We don't have, to off we don't have technology to offer. In the past, yes, we were the leaders of technology in Spain, Baghdad, and Damascus, and so on and so, but today we are running to New York, London, etc., to gain the knowledge. We don't have the technology. So what is it that we have to offer? We have to offer morality. The moral heart of civilization lies with us. As Prophet Muhammad had said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was only sent to perfect for you the highest of moral character traits. So this is the essential message of Islam. It is a moral message. And this is what we have to offer the world. So uh, we have to uh, be conscious of our Islam. We have to have knowledge by which to be able to understand how to live our day-to-day -day lives in our various professions, in our education, in our families, etc. We have to have that knowledge to be able to live that middle path. And inshallah, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, we have 
easy access today. Uh, we have the Islamic Online University, which I set up back in 2007, a means to make authentic Islamic knowledge available to the world. The Islamic Online University, in its diploma courses, is absolutely free. Anybody can register anytime, study at any time, at whatever pace you wish, no prerequisites to get to join it, doesn't matter what your age is, what, your, you know, what qualifications you have, academic, it is open to you. The Islamic Online University dot com. You can study at home, you know, wherever you have a chance. As long as you have internet, you can study. So we have this uh, product by the will of Allah. He made this available in our time where the knowledge is now so much more accessible to us. And Prophet Muhammad had stressed, Talabu al-ilmi farida ala kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. And this is knowledge primarily of the deen. To know who Allah is, and to know what He has commanded. To know who the Messenger of Allah was, and what He has taught. To guide us in our day-to-day -day life. So, the internet is now made this accessible to us. We also began to offer from last year a BA in Islamic Studies online, which is accredited. Uh, we have from universities in the Philippines and from Indonesia, which issue the degrees for us, and the cost is virtually nothing. So, inshallah, we hope that you would uh, participate in this and to support it in any way that you can, uh, whether offering help as volunteers with the university in, in its projects, etc., or whether it is financial, because it's all being run on individual uh, efforts and contributions in that way. So, uh, inshallah, we have an opportunity to know what that middle path is, and to avoid extremism, then we should take it. We have no excuse today with the access of the internet in our homes. You know, let us use it for more than gaming and chatting, you know, wasting a lot of our time. Let's get in and benefit from it from the perspective of knowing our religion. That we can, inshallah, in the future, according to the motto of the Islamic Online University, change the nation through education. So, inshallah, um, we'll stop here in the presentation on ex religious extremism. I hope that uh, the points have been clear. Uh, what we refer to as extremism in beliefs, the most dangerous area of extremism, where it ends us up with, where it takes us to in the end, uh, which is basically intermediacy, where we end up worshipping others instead of Allah, worshipping others through uh, worship Allah through others, or extremism in our acts, where we're doing a variety of different practices, customs, traditions, which are in fact not in keeping with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, whether it is Maulid, though Maulid has become a holiday in most Muslim countries today, but we have to know that this is an act which was not sanctioned by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his companions who best knew his teachings and best followed it, never did it. So we have to know that this is something which people have innovated, they have brought into the religion, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said, Kullu bid'atin dalala. Every innovation in religion is misguidance. It's a source of misguidance. So, inshallah, I will stop here and we'll take 